ان الحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله to proceed ikhwan akhawat respected elders ulama i grant you the warmest islamic greetings of peace assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh may the peace and blessings of allah azza wa jal be upon you all Ikhwan and akhawat, brothers and sisters, today we're going to be talking about a very important topic which is the purpose of life. This is a very important topic because without the purpose of life, in a way we don't have any life, if you think about it. Because you have, in today's day and age, in the 21st century, you have the secularists, which are those people who want to divorce Allah Azawajal away from social affairs and essentially from your life. You have the atheists who deny Allah Azza wa Jal and you have this resonating in society whether it's in, on education, at education, at the media, wherever you go you see it. And their perspective is that we don't have a purpose in life. Their perspective is we don't have any meaning, ultimate meaning. We have to make it up as we go along. And I would argue without purpose of life without a divine purpose for our life, we don't really have any meaning to our lives in the first place. Because if you think about it, take a divine purpose outside of your life, then it's all your subjective opinions. Your opinion on how you should live your life or why you exist is subject to yourself, subject to your own aql, subject to your nafs, your own disposition, subject to your ideas, subject to your own thoughts. So it's all relative. It's subjective to yourself, and relative to your own ideas. So we could all disagree. And if you take divine purpose out of the window, if you just chuck it out of life, then essentially you're left with someone who is a cosmic orphan. We're like a human being, and we've just been thrown into existence with no reason. Someone's thrown into this ocean full of sharks, and has left you alone, and you have to find your own way out. And if you continue this thought that you remove the divine purpose outside of our lives, then what difference does it make if I live my life as a shaitan, as a devil, and you live your lives as angels? It makes no difference. If there is no divine accountability, no divine purpose, if I live my life as a shaitan, as a devil, as an evil person, and you live your life as a very pious person, what difference does it make if we're just going to be worm buffet? We're going to end up in the grave. If we're going to end up in the grave, the worms are going to taste us and we're going to be one with the mud and the rats and the worms and the lice and the dust. If we're going to become one with this, what difference does it make? Maybe I should just live my life and get away with it and do what I want. What's in it for me? I'm a right jack kind of attitude. And this is why it's a very important topic. But we don't think about it though, that's the situation. Sometimes we just live our lives, we're brought up in a Muslim household and we just basically react to our social environment. We don't really think about our situation. But Allah tells us to think. Do you not use your intellect? Do you not use your mind? Allah has given you these qualities, these amazing qualities to refine, to understand your perspective, your basis, your purpose in this dunya. And it's very important. This is why Ibn Taymiyyah, one of the famous classical theologians, he wrote a text about the aql and the naql. He said, there's no contradiction between the aql and the text, but you have to have a sound aql. It has to be sound, it has to be refined with the Quran and the Sunnah to really understand the text for what it is. So use our minds so we know our situation and purpose in life. Continuing from this, we know that purpose in life is the most critical question because if you look at the state of the human being, he's been thrown into existence. It's like we, life could be like a huge factory and you just wake up in this factory, all the windows are closed, the doors are closed and people are just working. And you wake up and what are you going to ask yourself? How on earth did I get there? How on earth did I get here? What am I supposed to do? And where am I going? These three fundamental questions you would ask if you woke up in a factory with the windows shut and the doors closed and people were just doing the work. Now who is the intelligent guy? 
the one who's going to ask those questions and get answers or the one who just gets up and starts working in the factory just joining everyone else like sheep think about this who is the intelligent one you just wake up into, into this factory say you go to sleep you pray you pray with her, you go home you have something to eat maybe have some tea have some cha have some pokora have something whatever you guys eat yeah you then you go to sleep then you wake up in this factory you're gonna ask those questions how on earth did I get here where am I going what am I supposed to do here but many of us we just wake up in this factory and we start working like machines we're no different from a robot. We're no different from a social, biological robot. Because this is very important. Because if you think about it, there is an American writer once wrote that your birth, my birth, our births, was like being born and then being kidnapped and then sold into slavery. Listen to what I'm saying. Your birth, Uncle G. Your birth, Achi. Your birth, brother. Akhawat, sisters, your birth was like being born and then being kidnapped and then sold into slavery. Wallahi, that's the state of the human being. That is the state of the human being. Where even the kuffar, the non-Muslim philosophers said that this was a concept called thrownness. You're just thrown into reality with no choice. Because you never chose that you're going to be a black man. Did you choose you were going to be black? No. Did you choose that you're going to be Kashmiri? Mirpuri? Or whatever you are, Punjabi, oh Punjabi, yeah, or whatever, you didn't choose this. Did you choose that you're going to be white? Did you choose that you're going to be gorgeous, mashallah, tabarakallah? <laughs> yeah? I never chose that I was going to be Greek, that looks like a Pakistani. <laughs> yeah? But wallahi, think about this, did you have a choice? You didn't even choose that you were going to be a man. Akhawat sisters, you didn't even choose that you were going to be female. You had absolutely no choice. And by the way, you had no choice concerning your parents. No choice at all. Even your DNA, the biologists talk about that we have DNA. Even your DNA, you had no choice in your DNA. The thing that really shapes your biological makeup. No choice. Zero. Finished. Khalas. And then we think we're free. And we think we're free. We didn't choose our parents. We had no choice. We didn't choose the social economic environment where our parents came from. We didn't choose the geography. We didn't choose our lineage. We didn't choose where we came from. We didn't choose our color, our gender, our size, our shape. None of these things. And we think we're free. And on a side note, Sometimes we define ourselves by these things we had no choice over. Sometimes our tribe or our nationality is, is bigger and more important than Islam, which is called As-Sabiya in Islam and it's Haram. We can't take nationality over the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's nothing wrong with being proud where you come from. The Sahaba belonged to tribes and there was an element of halal pride if you want to use that term. But to take it over the deen, this was as sabiya Haram totally. And there is even a, a, a very damning hadith that someone who takes their nationality over the deen, it's equivalent of biting the father's private parts. This is a hadith, check out for yourself. I'm not ashamed to say this. It's the words of the Prophet And many of, know, many of you know this hadith as well. But you've been too scared to mention it. But we mention it because we're not afraid and we have to speak the truth. Because imagine if I took my Greekness over the deen. I would never become a Muslim. Because in Greece, they have this concept of In Greece, that means, in Greek it means the, the Greek Christian community. So being Greek and Christian is one and the same thing. If you change your religion, you're not Greek anymore. You become a traitor. Anyway, so the point is, go back to the main point, which is we don't even choose our parents, our color, our gender, all of these things. Now let me just go a bit more further. Not only are we enslaved to this, because we have almost a slavery to this, because we had no choice. We also have a slavery to our own self. The carnal, bestial aspects of humanity. Our instincts, our animalistic drives. Many of us are slaves to our nafs. 
This is why one of the 11th century theologians, Al-Ghazali, and Ibn Taymiyyah wrote about this, and Ibn Taymiyyah's students wrote about this as well. They basically said, especially Al-Ghazali in his book, The Alchemy of Happiness, he basically said, you think that you know yourself. You think you know yourself. Because when you're hungry, you eat. When you're enraged and angry, you fight. When you have the passions, you make love. And you think you know yourself. You're no different from an animal. But the reality of yourself is in your inwardness, who you are. Your aqidah, your actions, your belief, your iman. But many of us are like these animals. And you see this in our country, in England. Go on to the town square on a Friday night. Go to Leeds, city centre, Bradford. You see nothing but fitna and facade and chaos, right? Because these people, they're just reacting to the carnal beastial desires, right? Now don't judge them though. Because sometimes we do that. Ha, ah, look at me. I'm so great and pious. Look at the kuffar. This is not a sunnah, by the way. The sunnah is to feel sorry for them and help them and want to guide them and be there. And we want to bring them to us. Because in reality, when it comes to the layman, the awam, Joe Bloggs next door, there is no such thing as us and them. Do you know this? It's actually us and we want them to be us. Because we have a beautiful home called Islam. The door must always be open and invite people in. So when we see people in this state, we should actually feel for them and empathize and say, come, come back home. Because this is back home for them. It's the fitra. It's the innate disposition. So, as I was saying, many of us are just enslaved to our desires. This way Allah says in the Quran, have you not seen the one who takes his nafs, his desires as his ilah, as his object of worship? So you're enslaved, we can be enslaved to our desires, our, the carnal beast to aspects of humanity. It doesn't stop there. There's another type of slavery that we can't even escape. Social pressure, society. What society tells you, and I'm going to speak to the sisters about this, Akhawat. If I were to ask you what makes you feel pretty, many of our definitions would be not the definitions according to the Quran and Sunnah. Because according to the Quran and Sunnah, beauty is holistic. We don't say, does he have a nice arm? Does he have a nice e ear? Does he have a nice eyes? We don't reduce people to single parts. We see them holistically. That's why our deen is a deen of oneness. That's why we see the inner aspects of beauty and the outer aspects of beauty and it's all together. But, if I were to ask you, you'd probably give me a reductionist view on beauty. Meaning, oh, if I have nice eyes or if I have nice fingers, for example. This attitude itself has not come from your fitra and it hasn't come from the deen. It's come from advertisements like L'Oreal because I'm worth it. Yeah? Isn't it? We see this all the time and it permeates our society and it develops something called the social norm. The social norm. Let me give you an example. I used to be an international project manager. I used to work for the government many years ago. And I was a bit of a loud mouth, okay? This is why I talk now. Yeah. <laughs> and basically, I, we had a PA, a personal assistant, and she was wearing high heels, fair enough. And I'm not judging her, I just want to give you a reality of the example I'm trying to show. She was in high heels and what I noticed was she had like two plasters over her heel and it was slightly bleeding. And I asked her the question, what's wrong with you? Are you really comfortable in those? Yes, it makes me feel better about myself. I was like, are you sure? Are you really sure? Because you could, if you ask your feet that question, they'll testify against you. <laughs> so why do you think that should make you feel better about yourself? Because it makes me look good. Okay, good. Why does it make you look good and by whose definition? Is it really yours? And then I made her think, and this is the power of questioning. Wallahi, dawah is just about questioning. The Quran gives you questions. And in themselves, do they not see? Do they not reflect within themselves? Have you not seen the camel and how it was created? Questions, questions. Allah doesn't always give you answers. He's giving you these questions to direct you through this madness of life. To come to a conclusion that Allah is one and that He should be worshipped. So use questioning as well. Use the power of the Quran. So when you give them the tools of questioning, they're like, you know what? And then she took her shoes off. 
Because she understands this is not really me, it's not in line with my fitrah. It's a socialization. It's been as a result of the media. And you know why human beings are social animals? I did psychology at university and one of the reasons are that human beings by their very nature, they want certainty. They want certainty, they want to feel certain, they want to have yakin. If they don't feel certain about something, including their own beauty, they go to society because it's like almost like the most powerful thing around them because it's a consensus, it's the masses. And they, they will adopt what the society says. This is why, uh, brothers, how many of you have daughters? Put your hand up. May Allah bless your daughters, many of you. Let me give you some advice. Make sure from a very young age, your daughter feels she's intelligent. Your daughter feels she's beautiful. Your daughter feels she's beautiful outside and inside. Because if you don't, as a father, I know it's very hard because you're from the Asian subcontinent. Where it's like love and being soft and nice is no part of the culture. Get over it. This is your jihad and nafs. Because the sunnah is like this. The Prophet ﷺ used to kiss his grandchildren. He used to have mercy on them. He used to say, Ya Allah, I love so and so, so I love so and so. So at the end of the day, we have to break through this. It's not just good wearing beards, having long robes and looking the part. But if our hearts are messed up, what is the point? Because even goats have beards. It's dead protein, isn't it? Now the reason we get reward because of the obedience, of the love of, 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 of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. But if inside it's not there, and this is why many of our youth are, are, are astray because it's the parenting. Wallahi the most important thing. So make your daughters feel pretty, make them feel intelligent. You know why? Because if they're uncertain about themselves, where are they going to go? To the social norm. It's a psychological process, it's very simple. And it, there's two processes for this, it's called informational social influence and normative social influence. And you don't have to know the technicalities in the academia. The point is, it's almost an established fact, society counts. This is why in the Sunnah, the Prophet ﷺ would go to the influentials for the da'wah. Because the tribesmen would influence their people. Do you see? The social effect. So make sure our daughters and even our brothers they feel confident with themselves, they don't have low self-esteem. I travel the whole world, brothers and sisters. And what I see from our youth, low self-esteem, no confidence, no ability to talk, no ability to say something good about the deen, have an inferiority complex. And it's not their fault, it's not the deen's fault, it's the parents. Wallahi, it's the parents. And we need to fix up all of your future parents. So we need to instill this confidence from the deen inside them. So they could be people who go out there and they are people of Tawheed. Because Tawheed, what does it do? It should make you think you could take over the world. That you could move mountains by the will of Allah Azza wa Jal. Why? Because this is real Tawheed. You know, we always think, you know, Uluhiya, Rububiya, Asma wa Sifat, all the categories of Tawheed. Yes, this is academia. This is academia. But what does it really mean? What do we say about Allah sometimes? La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. There is no true power apart from the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If this is true, here, not here, here. If it's true, then it should change our whole lives. We should never have an inferiority complex anymore. And we should believe that we could move mountains. Why? Because behind everything is the will and power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When things happen, it's because of His will and because of His qudra, because of His power. Not because of Joe Bloggs, the Zionists, media, Sky News, this, that, the other, the government, oh, I'm a victim. When did the Prophet sallallahu act like a victim? Never. Because they knew this basic principle of Tawheed. Nothing happens except by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Khalas. This is why the Sahaba, they had nothing. They didn't have the iPads, the iPhones. They didn't have computer systems, no technology, effective weaponry. They just had the Quran and Sunnah. They had Tawheed in their hearts. And there were a bunch of villages equivalent in a contemporary sense. And they arose and they took over the world and spread the peace and justice of Islam. What do you think that was? Because they had great weaponry, they had inter-ballistic missiles, they had nuclear weaponry, they had diplomacy. You think they had that stuff? They used to eat lizards. What are you talking about? It's because they knew Allah now. They knew Allah and when they saw creation, they never said creation has intrinsic power. Meaning that this piece of creation with this human being or an obstacle, that has the power to change my destiny. Then you know. It's Allah Azza wa Jal. And since they didn't know the will of Allah, only Allah knows the will of Allah, then that gave them an infinite possibility. This is the empowerment of Tawheed. 
So, we can be enslaved to society as well. And we see this even in our Asian culture. Maybe not you guys because you're the pious type, mashallah, tabarakallah. But let's, let's be honest, in many types of our family, if you go to a wedding, what do you see? You see people who have been poor all their life, spend money, thousands and thousands and thousands on wedding dresses and gold and you know, a thousand people are there and half of them they don't even know. Yeah, they're not even related. They somehow, you know, used to comb one of their pet rabbit's hair or something. You know, that's how distant they are, yeah? And then they're there and it's all about show and how much gold you had and where are you going to go and the mahar and all of this stuff. And you know, God forbid one auntie wearing the same wedding outfit she wore last year. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. It would be day of judgment scenario, yeah? You can't be seeing her with the same shoes. I ain't wearing the same shoes, yeah? Do you see the point? It's all about status and what you look like. And this is a social norm in our own communities. We've adopted a Bollywood Hinduistic kind of culture. And we've, we've made nikah so hard. Wallahi, we've made zina easy, nikah hard. Wallahi, I know, I see youth in students, they find it so hard. We've made zina, fornication, easy and marriage difficult. And also we have other issues, isn't it, in our community concerning the social norm. Education. He has to be a doctor. If he's not that clever, an engineer. If he's not that clever, a lawyer. If he's not that clever, mufti saab. Isn't it? Like the deen comes like on the bottom of the list. And if you want to marry someone, even I've seen this with practicing sisters, niqab, gloves, shoes, nets, the works, yeah, everything's covered, right? And they will be like, oh, I want him to be a doctor. And then the deen is like fourth. What's wrong with these people? We've been socialized, isn't it? We've got still this kind of, this caste Hindu system kind of culture and it's permeated even amongst pious people. Wallahi, there's a hadith. To the best of my knowledge, and I can be corrected obviously. In Tirmidhi, with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa I'm paraphrasing. He said, if someone comes to your daughter with good morals, and you reject him, there will be fitna and fasad in the world. There will be fasad. There will be fasad. And then they said, what if he doesn't have any money? Listen, what if he doesn't have any money? And do you know how he replied sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? He said, if someone comes to your daughter with good morals, there will be facade. And then he repeated it again. What is the Prophet Wasallam indicating here? That this is the most important thing. Not the money. Money comes and goes, Ikhwan. But yet, we have that social norm in our culture that if he's not of a high status, it's, it's terrible. It's just terrible. He just, you know, my, my landlord is an ex-Hindu who'd converted to Islam. And he's got a, a job working on the trains, okay? And he said, I can't find any sister. He said, I can't find any sister because they want this, they want that, and Dean for them is secondary. And, and, he, if, if, and, and that's his issue, you see, he's got concern. And the reason we have these issues is because we adopt another social norm. So we're enslaved by the social masses, by the influentials in our, in our culture. So look at this, what we've discussed. You didn't choose your parents, you didn't choose your biology, you didn't choose your society that you're enslaved to as well, you didn't choose social biological conditioning, you didn't choose your DNA, you didn't choose your gender, your colour, your parenting, your lineage, your, your society, your nationality, you didn't, and, and we're enslaved to our nafs as well, to our carnal, beastal aspects of mankind. So we're slaves. We're slaves. This is it. The only real freedom you have if you shoot yourself. Honestly. Honestly, that's the only act of real freedom. Even the Western philosophers would write essays on, on suicide. Arthur Schopenhauer wrote an essay on suicide. David Hume, he wrote an essay on suicide. I think some of them really understood the only act of freedom is to kill yourself. That's the state of mankind without purpose. Forget the drink and the alcohol and the fun and games they have. You, you go underneath that, you scratch the surface, they're just slaves. We're all slaves. But how do we find true liberty? How does the soul, the ruh, the ruh, how does it find liberty? And interestingly, the word ruh is linked to the word raha, which means serenity, liberty. And the only way to escape from this slavery is to become a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the real bloke. That's the real man. Not the man who's enslaved to his desires, the man who's enslaved to society, the man who's enslaved to things that he didn't even choose. 
SubhanAllah was so proud to be the chief of a tribe. You didn't even choose that. You're a slave to that. It's rubbish. Sometimes we're so proud because, you know, we have the Gyaldam, yeah, as we say in Hackney. You know what I'm saying? Isn't it? But you're enslaved to your carnal desires. You're just like an animal. You know, different from the lion with many lionesses. Big deal. Wagwan. Yeah? Make it, make it real. Let's make it youth. So you're just a slave? Oh, you think your hair looks nice, sister, yeah? Well, you're just copying so-and-so from the L'Oreal advert. You, you, you're just a slave to her. Really, you're just a slave. You're always going to be enslaved. But how do you free yourself from this stuff? By enslaving yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ubudiyya, as Ibn Qayyim said, the 14th century theologian and scholar of Islam. Ubudiyya, having a servanthood, a worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah transcends you. Allah knows Hamza better than Hamza knows Hamza. Allah knows Fatima better than Fatima knows Fatima. Allah knows... Muhammad whether Muhammad knows Muhammad Allah knows Aisha better than Aisha knows herself and he created you and he created everything that exists so therefore he transcends that so he knows what's better for you so having that enslavement to Allah frees you and elevates you from the dunya elevates you from enslaving yourself to your conditioning the enslavement to your nafs your ego the enslavement to the things that you had no choice the enslavement to your color, to your background, to your nationality, to social pressure, to the L'Oreal adverts, to everything. That is the true freedom. It's the paradox that you, your soul is liberated. The ruh attains raha. It has the same linguistic roots via the worship and enslavement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah. You know someone really realizing this, that no matter what I do, I'm going to be a slave to these ephemeral, empty things. Things of the dunya. Coming from the word adna, which means something lowly. Am I going to enslave myself to things that have hardly any worth? I'm going to enslave myself to the animalistic, instinctive desires of myself? I'm going to enslave myself to things I had no choice over? Like my gender? Like my parenting, like my society, like my nationality? Of course not. So how then do you escape this, these shackles by enslaving yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And interestingly, what does Allah say about our purpose in life? That He created man and jinn illa liya'budun, except to worship Allah. It's the most important aspect of worship, of course. But worship is a comprehensive concept in Islam. It means obeying Allah, loving Allah, taking Him as your authority, and knowing Allah. Let me repeat. Obeying Allah, loving Allah, taking Him as, taking him as your authority, and knowing <coughs> Allah. As Ibn Abbas anhu mentioned some of these things as well. So this is the ultimate act of liberation. This is the ultimate act of being a true human being. In my humble opinion, if someone knows this and they don't start worshipping Allah, how can you consider yourself a human being? How could you? In reality, you're no different from a piece of wood or this pen. It's made of carbon, you're made of carbon. What difference does it make? If you're just reacting to your just biological and physical nature, then you're no different from a pen. It, 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 it obeys its physical nature. If you write, it works. Even a rat, a lowly rat, when it nibbles on decaying matter and it runs through the sewer, it's obeying its nature. It's enslaved to its physique, its materialistic biological reality. And if you just do that the same, well, what makes you different from a rat? What makes you different from a rat? That's why Allah says, Nay, Bal. Bal in Arabic is like saying, it's like a rhetorical, it's balaga, meaning they're not animals. Bal, they're even worse than cattle. So, someone who does this, as Allah in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah says, they are worse than cattle. So, do we want to be worse than cattle? Do you see the unique spin on this? Because we think when we move away from religion, we're actually free. 
We think when we move away from religion, we're free. When we move away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're actually free. But it's actually the opposite. When you enslave yourself to Allah, you remove the shackles of all of these types of slavery. So, how do we know this now? How do we know that this is actually true? We must worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well, there's a few things we could articulate here. Let's talk about Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah talked about the fitrah. The fitrah in Arabic language comes from the root fatara. And you have words like fatrun and fatarahu. That Allah created something within you to acknowledge His oneness and worship Him. And if you really think about it, if you take away parenting, if you take away your conditioning, if you take away some biological aspects, if you take away and strip away all of these social effects as well, the fitrah will be there. And you could ask it a question almost. Who is your Rabb? And they know it's Allah. This is why even atheists on a sinking ship are no longer atheists. There's a famous saying, there is no atheist on a sinking ship. Wallahi! And this is not just a cop-out. This is actually a key intellectual argument. Because it shows the disposition, the natural disposition of man. Why are you calling out to something that you don't believe? If you look at the BBC archives of the Titanic, there were some survivors saying that although we didn't believe in God, our last things were just praying to God. Wallahi! That was the only hope. And what does Allah say in the Qur'an? They remember Allah, they worship Allah. But when they get on the shore and they're safe, they forget Him. And this is the aspect of the fitrah. And the fitrah can be justified even academically. Even academically, read the works of Professor Bruce Hood, Professor Petrovich, Professor Bartlett and others from Oxford. They are anthropologists and they said if you took children, even from atheist households, you put them on a desert island, they would eventually believe that God exists. You even see this in atheist communist countries. Atheist communist countries. Like China and Russia. Look at communist Russia. They used to have huge statues of Lenin and, and Stalin. And they used to almost worship them. They would have them in awe and revere them. Which is an act of worship. So even in atheistic cultures, that fitrah is coming out. So we know this is true because the fitrah is dictating this. That Islam is true. That worshipping of Allah is true. So there's a fitrah aspect. There's an innate aspect. We have another aspect which is aqli. It's intellectual. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers these questions for us. We don't have to go outside of the Qur'an. Allah azza wa jal in chapter 52 verses 35 to 36, He talks about the creation of the human being. And He says, Do you think you came from nothing? You were created from nothing. Did you create yourself? Or did you create the heavens and the earth? Now this, according to the Mufassirun, those who explain the Qur'an, the exegetes like Ibn Kathir and others. And this is also the opinion of Dr. Jafar Idris. And Ibn Taymiyyah talks about this argument as well. This could be applied to anything that begins. The universe began, we know this now, so it can't come from nothing, it's impossible. What's zero plus zero plus zero? Is it three? It's zero. Can it create itself? Can you give birth to yourself? Can your mother give birth to herself? Self-creation is a paradox, it's an impossibility. Can we have a forever chain of creation? This is impossible, so it must be an uncreated creator that exists. Very simple, very simple key intellectual argument. So we know that Allah the Divine is true. And we also know the Quran is true as well, because it says, your purpose in life is to worship Allah, it's just a verse, right? That verse comes from the Quran. The Quran is from Allah. We have so many reasons and you know the answers as well. Let me remind you, Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبِ مِمَّا نَزَلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا فَأَتُّوا بِسُرَةٍ مِنْ مِثْلِهِ وَدُعُوا شُهَدَاءَكُمْ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ And if you're in doubt about this book, we have sent down to our servant, referring to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then bring one chapter like it. Call on your witnesses and supporters besides Allah, in kuntum sadiqeen. If you're truthful in your claim, and we know this opens a whole window of intellectual arguments, linguistic, historical, natural phenomena, a whole array of, array of arguments that show that the Quran is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Concerning the linguistic, for example, we know that the Arabs of the time were the best at expressing themselves in the Arabic tongue. But they failed. They absolutely failed. So it can't come from a human being, it came from Allah. This is why even Western academia testify to this. You have Professor Bruce Lawrence from Duke University in his book, a Qur The Quran, a biography on page number 8. He says, Quranic verses as tangible signs are expressive of inexhaustible truth. They signify meaning, laid within meaning, light upon light, miracle after miracle. We have Reverend R. Boswell Smith in his book, Muhammad and Muhammadanism. He said, the Quran is a miracle of purity of style, of wisdom and of truth. It is one miracle claimed by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and a miracle indeed it is. You have Professor Anthony Jones, he analyzed chapter 12 of the Quran and talked about its imaginistic features. You have the book by Professor Neil Robinson who used to lecture at Leeds University around the corner. He became a Muslim as well. He wrote the book, Discovering the Quran, a contemporary approach to a veiled text. He has a whole chapter on the dynamic style of the Quran. You have Professor Martin Zamir from the Netherlands. He said, notwithstanding pre-Islamic poetry, the Quran is the most eminent written manifestation of the Arabic language. We have Professor Hamilton Gibb, Wallahi, who go on and on. It challenged the best people who could effectively challenge the Quran, they failed. It can't come from the best people, therefore it comes from the divine. It can't come from nature, it comes from the supernatural. And that's one argument, we have so many. And even the life of the Prophet ﷺ, when we look at his life, we know the deen is true, because we could never say he was a liar. If he wasn't a liar, then we know his claim was true. Because if you, I studied psychology at university, and to claim that Muhammad ﷺ is a liar, is to claim your own mother never gave birth to you. Wallahi ikhwan akhawat, if I were to ask you, prove to me your mother gave birth to you. You'd be very hard to find proof. Prove to me your own mother gave birth to you. All you have to rely on is five testimonies. The testimony of your mother. The testimony of your father. The testimony of the midwife, the testimony of the doctor, and the testimony of the birth certificate. You have five chains of narration concerning your mother gave birth to you. You have no other evidence, and you know it deep down inside is true. But I would argue if you reject Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa it's equivalent of rejecting your mother, because we have 10,000 Thousands of chains of narration that are established to be true, effectively saying that this man would never speak a lie, that what he came with is true. This is in the science of hadith, in ilm al rijal, in the science of the biographies of people. We have 10,000 biographies for Sahaba and people in the chains of narration. 10,000. We know their nickname, we know where they came from, if they had good memory, their age, if they met the other person in the chain of narration and they're all trustworthy. So to reject the narratives concerning the Prophet wasallam that he was speaking the truth, it's equivalent of rejecting your own mother. Because you only have five chains of narrations, and the people in these chains, they're not perfect, they're not fully trustworthy. Do you see? So if you want to reject Muhammad upon whom be peace, fine, go reject your mum. I did this once at Queen Mary University after a debate with an atheist, Professor Graham Thompson. And there's this half Greek, half Serbian guy. His name is George. Amazing akhlaq he has now, yeah? I could just, uh, wallahi, 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 wallahi. That morning, after Fajr, I made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Allah, let someone come to the deen via our hands. Wallahi, it was a proper, sincere dua. I was feeling down, I was like, give me a signal. Wallahi, I was shocked. I was like, nah, it's too good to be true here. Yeah? I was shocked. I was there, some guy called George, he, he had the bit of doubts. He read some books, had the bit of doubts. And he was like, I could just see it in his face. He's like, yeah, but I don't know, I'm not too sure. And we were there for an hour and a half nearly. And I was like, you know what? I gave him my phone, because he's Greek. He knows a bit. Greeks like Punjabis, by the way. Yeah? <laughs> Our speech could be very vile, yeah, very aggressive sometimes, although it's very poetic as well. And we're very like, kind of, you know, we break plates at weddings. So I had my phone, I was like, listen bro, 
You know the historical narratives, you believe them to be true, yes you do. Well, if you reject Muhammad today, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, go reject your mom. Because you know it's equivalent of rejecting your mother. Because you know you got more evidence that he was truthful than your mother's truthful. So go reject your mom. Take the phone, throw at him, take the phone, man. Be a man. Call. And he was like this, oh my god, where's the guy? It's about, I just wanted you to be honest. Fine, I'm not, I'm not forcing you. Reject him. Reject him, that's your freedom. But be intellectually honest. Then go call your mom and say, Mom, I now have to doubt that you gave birth to me. He became Muslim. He's been Muslim for a year now. And wallahi, this brother has amazing adab. Amazing adab. You know his mom? His mom is like, subhanAllah, like better than I've seen us to our own mothers. And his mom is non-Muslim. She calls, he's halfway ha having fun with the brothers. I gotta go guys. Straight away, no complaints. My mom wants me home at 9, he's there at 10 to 9. I mean, he's very good adab. He says, brother, I love you for the sake of Allah. Brother, do you need anything? Brother, take care of yourself. You know, you know, you could just see that Islam has really penetrated his heart, yeah? So that's an example of showing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi was speaking the truth. So we have good arguments for the deen. There's no excuse for us. So what we have to do is be people of the Qur'an and start reflecting. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an وَكَذَلِكَ نُفَصُّلُ الْعَيَاتِ لِقَوْمٍ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ And thus, do we explain our signs and evidences in detail for those يَتَفَكَّرُونَ For those who reflect. You know if you go to the classical dictionaries, you know what this means? It doesn't mean, oh, this is a nice water bottle. It's not superficial reflection. Go to the classical dictionaries. Don't be a desert romantic. You're sitting on the deck chair, writing poetry to a loved one, touching the sand, looking at the stars, and sipping a glass of milk <laughs> just to make it halal. Yeah, it's not that kind of desert romantic. Rather, the thing that you're reflecting upon, you must inquire the meaning of it, the implications. What does it mean that there's a beginning to the universe? What does it mean that I'm in a state of slavery? How do I free myself from this? What does it mean that I have consciousness? I have a ruh. That consciousness came from non-conscious matter. How can this be? These are all questions that Allah gives us and makes us think about man, life and the universe and our own position. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَأَيْنَ تَذْحَبُونَ فَأَيْنَ تَذْحَبُونَ And where are you going? You, speaking right to you. Where are you going? Forget Joe Blog so and so, but what about you, Wagwan? Yeah? If you want it in your language, speak it in your language. Where are you going? We're always looking outside, isn't it? Always looking into the stars. But the Quran always makes us look at the small universe inside. The micro universe within the macro universe. This is why even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Are you going to follow your forefathers? Even if their surname was Ahmed, or Sayyid, or Abbasi, or Bat. Yeah? Where were the Pakistani names you have these days? Yeah? Even if they, that's their surname, are you going to follow your forefathers? Even if they were wrong? Even if they were baseless? Even if they were not based on the truth? Even if they followed as nationalism, and we have to reject this? Quran makes us think. It's a thinking man's book. Now it doesn't mean you guys have to be intellectuals and PhDs, no. Although I heard there's a lot of PhDs in Dewsbury. Private hire drivers. <laughs> no, wait, kidding. <laughs> so the point is, you don't have to do this, but you have to use whatever you know to be thinking. Your own, in your own realm. Any, anyone could do it. Wallahi, go speak to one of your grandmothers. If your great-grandmother is alive, speak to her. She'll come with hikmah and wisdom and she's never been to school. I'm talking about the natural type of thinking. The questioning about what is going on in life. Who am I? Whose am I? For whom am I? Why am I? Answering all those questions. Because no matter what level of education you have, if you're stuck in a dark room, everyone's going to ask the same question. How did I get here? Where am I going? What's going to happen to me after? And don't forget, Ikhwan and Akhawat, the reality is that this life is nothing. It's nothing. It's like a blink of an eye. The reality is the Akhirah. The reality is the Akhirah. One family member just spoke to me a while ago and said, when are we going to start living? 
And I said, we haven't really been born yet. Our real birth is when we die. This is why mot and the other terms in the Quran for death do not mean annihilation, they mean a transition. Linguistically, they mean a transition. So this is like, we're still in the embryonic stage of our life. We're still an embryo. We are still an embryo. When we die, we're going to be born and we're going to see reality. Jannah or Jahannam. Human beings naturally want to go towards pleasure. They want to run away from pain. So let's talk about the pain. Jahannam is forever. Do you know what forever means? Eternality, eternal, infinite. Let me describe infinite for you. You're on a desert island. And all you see around you is an infinite space of sea. And you have a small spoon and a bucket and it's really hot. And you dip your spoon in the ocean and you tip it into the bucket. And you wait a thousand years. And after a thousand years you dip your spoon into the ocean and you empty it into the bucket. Then you wait another thousand years. Then you dip your spoon into the ocean, empty into the bucket, and you wait another thousand years. When will the ocean be diminished? Never. Never. Because the heat of the sun is always going to evaporate what's going to be in your bucket. That's eternal, Ikhwan. That's forever. That's the nature of, of this life is a minute long. We've got a minute left maybe. You don't know. Some Sahaba when they tied their shoelace, they didn't know they were going to survive until tying the next shoelace. This is forever and we don't want to be in Jahannam. We want to attain the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's a road map for this. And what's the road map of attaining the pleasure of Allah? First and foremost, believing in Allah. Believing in the pillars of Iman. And worshipping Him. The most important thing after this, in my humble opinion, and we say this to all of the reverts. We don't say grow a beard. We don't say do your hair like this. We don't say do your shoes like this. We don't say do this, that, the other. We don't even say none of that. Because wallahi, I think it's irrelevant. At that stage. If you take the hadith of Muad ibn Jabal, when he went to Yemen, the Prophet said, get them to believe in Tawheed. If they accept, then the Salah. And if they accept, then the Zakah. So there's a gradual process. So the point is, for the new Muslims, what do you teach them? Salah, most important. Prayer, 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 prayer. It defines who you are. It's the dhikr of Allah, it's His obedience, and it is the manifestation, it's the enactment of your true belief in Him. And your purpose in life is to worship Him. So if you don't worship Allah by praying the obligatory prayers, you're still worshipping other things. Your nafs, your ego, society, social pressure. This is the tool, the mechanism that's been obligated upon you to free yourself from these things. And so you can come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and feel the bliss of the worship, but also fulfilling your purpose in life. This way Allah says in the Quran, if you forget Allah, Allah will make you forget your own self. Which means that you having an identity as a Muslim, as a believer, as a true human being is only through the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahi, I see this in my life. You cut away from the sunnah prayers, from the afkar, from the worship, you're hanging on a thin thread and you see it. I come up with things that I don't usually come up with, even intellectually. Because if we believe in Islam, even your mind is affected by your qalb, your heart, your state of heart. You know, my inclinations towards brothers and the ummah is a bit less. I'm not treating my mom so well, my family so well. And I always think, look, it's your worship's messed up. Wallahi, every time I have your solid, it's bliss. Not bliss, you have your struggles, but you feel it, you feel wholesome. You feel wholesome. Major cause of depression amongst the ummah is because they've moved away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is making them forget their own selves. Because their identity, the, the holistic nature of what it means to be a human being for a Muslim is via the worship of Allah. Try it. Taste it. Trust me. Try it. Taste it. And you come to the point that if the whole world were to argue against Islam, you still believe. Because once you've tasted paradise, you know it's true. Like Ibn Taymiyyah said, you will never... You probably will never go to Jannah if you haven't tasted Jannah in this, in this life. And the Jannah in this life is the worship of Allah. It's the reading of the Quran. It's, it's praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.
Now you may think, who am I? I've come to this masjid. I spoke to some girls the other day. I've got a girlfriend. I drink some alcohol. I do this and I do that. I'm not good. I lie to my parents. I pretend to pray. I'm a fake Muslim. I'm a big sinner. I do major sins. Listen to me very carefully, please, in the last few minutes. Wallahi, by Allah, this attitude is an attitude from shaitan. Allah always allows U-turns. Always. Always allows U-turns. Don't despair of the mercy of Allah, Allah says in the Quran. Ya ibadi, all my believing servants, do not despair of my mercy. For Allah forgives all sins. All sins, even shirk, if you don't die on shirk, obviously. Because the Sahaba were on shirk, they became Muslim, they were forgiven. If you did previous shirk and you do repentance, Allah forgives. The only sin He doesn't forgive, you die upon shirk, or you didn't repent from shirk. So Allah is saying, all those sins you're thinking about, Allah's rahmah and forgiveness overcomes this. Don't play into the hands of shaitan that you won't go to the masjid and you won't start praying because you go all of these bad deeds. Don't be like that. This is not from Allah. Allah, your Lord is a merciful Lord. Your Lord is Al-Wudud. You know what Al-Wudud means? It's His name. It's an intrinsic part of His being, which means the excessively loving. The excessively loving. It's an excessive form of love. The Prophet said that Allah loves you more than a mother loves her child. You find me a greater love in the dunya. The greatest love is the, is the mother's love. But Allah loves you more to indicate the greatness of His love. All He wants you to do is repent. That is it. Tawbah. Tawaba. To return. Linguistically means to return. Just to return to Him. That's all He's saying. That's all He is saying. And he can't force you to do Tawbah. Because that would mean there's no meaning to it. So us having free choice is a blessing from Allah. And he's saying, I forgive, just repent. Raise your hands tonight and say, Ya Allah, I have done these sins. You know me better than I know myself. I've done sins that I don't even know of and you know. But forgive me, I'm taking the first step. Fajr. Dhuhr. Asr. And continuing. And you hit the floor. Bounce back. No one's going to be perfect. No one's going to stay the same. Iman fluctuates. But keep with your prayers. That is the key to the success. Indeed, unquestionably successful are the believers. So don't despair, Ikhwan. No matter, even an hour ago you did the sin. Even two minutes ago you did the sin. Don't be in that state of despair. Because Allah says in the Quran elsewhere, only the disbelievers despair of His mercy. Remember, the doors of repentance are open until the time of death. The door of repentance are open into the time of death. And repentance doesn't have to be public. You don't have to write it in the skies and the walls. All Allah wants you to do is to humble yourself before Him. Wake up in the last third of the night, raise your hand and say, Ya Allah, forgive me. I beg for your forgiveness. I strongly intend never to repeat those sins. And have an action plan for yourself. But don't, get, don't make it difficult. Don't think now, I have to wear these clothes, recite the whole of the Quran and learn a 50 hadith and learn you know, the statements of the scholars and become a scholar and learn Arabic and balaga and rhetoric and know the works of Ibn Taymiyyah, Al Ghazali, Qurtubi, uh, Imam Rajab al Hanbali, blah blah blah. No, no one's expecting that from you. Just pray. Pray. Start with the prayer and move forward. And if you don't know how to pray, there's plenty of brothers that know how to pray and just ask them. Allah says in the Quran, if you don't know, ask those who know. If you don't know, ask those who know. And just a word of warning, not warning, but some advice. Remember the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. He said, Al-Mu'minu Miratul Mu'min. Al-Mu'minu Miratul Mu'min. The believer is a mirror of another believer. 
We don't want our community to become a society of snitches, a society of pointing the finger. Ah, look at him. He missed his fajr. I didn't. I feel so great about myself. Ah, look at her. Her hijab has changed from, from black to pink. It's too bright. Or she's not wearing jilbab anymore. She's wearing maxi dresses. Yeah? Or whatever. This is shaitan. Because according to this prophetic tradition and other values in Islam, when we see a fault in your brother or sister, it means you have that fault. When you see their sadness, it means you have that sadness. When you see their happy, it means you have that happiness. If you're looking at the mirror and you've got a blemish on your face, are you going to wipe the mirror? No. You're going to change yourself. So we should treat our brothers and sisters like that. So we elevate each other, not condemn each other. To make a place of love and rahmah, the Prophet said that you will not go to paradise until you believe and you won't believe until you love one another. Love one another, not hate, not mock, not ridicule, not point the finger, not think you're better, not be arrogant, not be non-approachable, unapproachable, not to be harsh, but to love one another. So you facilitate this like when people come to this masjid, for example, they should feel a loving home. They should feel love in this masjid. Khalas. That's what they should feel. Just like the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So, Ikhwan, may Allah subhanahu wa taala bless you. Obviously, all the mistakes are mine and from my ego and shaitan, and all good is from Allah subhanahu wa taala. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta wa astaghfiruka wa atubu Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, there's a question here that, oh sorry, there's a question here that says, if you go to hell, can you ever enter to heaven? The answer is yes. If you're a Muslim, um, if you, we, we read basic works like Aqeedah Tahawiyya, which is a creedal book that many, all the Muslims agree with. Obviously the interpretations vary. But in terms of this one is, there's a creedal statement in Aqeedah Tahawiyya that basically says, we Muslims believe that all Muslims will go to Jannah. This is, this is our Aqeedah. Some will get purification in the hellfire, others won't. Some will enter hellfire for a shorter and longer than others. But at the end of the day, if you were a Muslim, you would eventually enter paradise. Ah, it's a good question. <laughs> There's a logician in the room. What's the purpose of the hereafter? The purpose of the hereafter? That's a good question actually. I don't know the answer to that. For my in initial tadabbur reflection on this, which is not an answer, so don't quote me, is to be in eternal bliss and enjoy the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and enjoy His promise. Because Allah promises the reward of His eternal bliss for the believers. And that's the purpose. The purpose is to be in bliss. If anyone has a better answer, please, please. By the way, no fiqh questions. I'm not a qualified mufti in any shape or form. Uh, no other type of questions. If I, don't know, if, I don't know, if I don't know something, I'll tell you. Because just because I'm a speaker, it doesn't mean I'm a qualified scholar or mufti or sheikh saab. No, I'm not. Yeah? Okay? So I don't need to be under that impression. Uh, because that impression is a dangerous impression. Because someone who speaks automatically, they're a sheikh. No, that's not. I'm not even worth the toenail, toenail of a sheikh. Yeah? So whatever questions I can answer, I will answer. Here's some good how do we break free from nationalism? You know, I think most of the problems in Islam all comes down to the nafs. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps us understand or gives us tools in the Quran to deal with the nafs. For example, Allah reminds us where we're going. Allah says, Kullu nafs in Every soul is going to taste death. Your nationalism is not going to save you in the day of judgment. No matter how big you think you are. And by the way, just to be very, very frank, the nations you're so proud of are rubbish. <laughs> Pakistan's a failed state. Bangladesh is killing Muslims at the moment. Where else are you guys from? You, it's a failed state. Azad Kashmir has no political authority. Kashmir, the other part, is taken over by India. I mean, wh wh who are you? Who are you? Who are you? You're nobody. We're no one. Our nationalism is, has been cursed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at our nations. We can't even defend our own Muslims. We can't even feed our own people. And you're proud of where you're from? SubhanAllah, I'm Greek. I'm not even proud of where I'm from. And Greeks had a bigger empire than you. 
we, we, we've got a greater history than you. You're what? You started in 1950s? Bangladesh, 1971? And you think you're somebody? I'm sorry, this is bakwa, sorry, this is crazy, this is rubbish. I get so angry when I say it's because it's a disease in the ummah. You know why? Wallahi, we have black brothers, they convert to Islam. Pious brothers, better than most of the Asian brothers sometimes. And they go to an Asian cha-cha. Say, Ya cha-cha, Assalamu alaikum rahmatullah. Uh, you know, I love you to bits, I see you in the masjid. Can I ask for your daughter's hand? He's gonna have a heart attack. <laughs> yeah, galima, you know? What the heck is this guy? Yes or no? And I'm telling you, even some of you have this in your hearts now. Even you have the, you, look, I know you guys, right? I'm in the Asian community, I'm married into the Asian community, okay? So I know Wagwan. I know what's going on. Even if you're pious, our hearts sometimes, you know, will never allow our daughters to marry a black man. Never. Forget that. A Punjabi can't even marry a Kashmiri. A Kashmiri can't even marry a Bengali. An Afghani can't even marry an Afghani. <laughs> yeah, do you see the problem here? Nationalism is destructive. It's destructive. And it's one of the main issues, I think, why there's a lot of sisters who are pious that are unmarried. Because they can't find someone within the community and therefore the door is shut for them. They can't go outside of the community. And this is a shame. So remember where we're going, death. And, and death will break us. National is not going to help us. It's not going to take us anywhere. And I'm not saying this to offend you, Ikhwan Akhawat. We should be proud of our language. Urdu is a beautiful, I mean, Allama Iqbal, what a beautiful poet. What a beautiful poet. You know, there's one poetry I like that was translated into English. He said, you know, there's a, there's a big question that's, that's affected the East, which is, does God exist? But I give them a new question. Does the self exist? You don't even know who you are and you're thinking about God. And once you know who you are, you know Allah exists. And in themselves, do they not reflect? Do they not see? So respect your language, respect your cultural customs that are not against Islam. But don't make it now your creed, your aqidah. It is the yardstick, it's the, the lenses, the glasses you put on your, your face to see the world. And it's all judged by those nationalistic boundaries. We are one ummah, khalas. Whether you like it or not, we bleed in the same color. We smile in the same language and we laugh in the same language. And we eat with the same hand. Yeah? Come on, we're one. We are one and remember this. Remember this, okay? You know, my parents are non-Muslim. But they don't have Asabiya. When I was growing up, my dad said, oh, forget Greece. You know, I don't want you to be defined by Greek. I want you to be defined by your human nature. Turks came to my house, blacks, Asians, whites, greens, blues, purples, rainbows. Everybody came into the house. And that's my dad, he's not even Muslim. So why would my dad, who's not a Muslim, follow the values that we should be following? This is why I'm upset. Because at home I see Islam, but they're not Muslim. But when we go, when I go to the Muslim community, I don't see Islam. How does that make me feel? And other reverts. Wallahi, and we claim it, complain about the EDL. <laughs> There's more racism in our community than the EDL. Listen to me carefully. I don't care how much you've been beaten up. There is more racism in the Muslim community than the EDL. At least the EDL, they have Asians, black Sikhs in the group. You know, we can't even... Uh, you, even in Bangladesh, right? A Chittagonian can't marry a Sileti. Isn't that right? It's terrible. And I think really the only way to break nationalism is to, to belittle it a lot, you know? Because it's all based on ego. And remember where you came from. Allah tries to break our nafs and says, You were a baby. You could even wipe your own backside or keep your head up. And now you think, you know, you're something. You were a despised fluid. A despised fluid and you think you're special. So these kind of principles and realities will make us realize that we're actually nothing. Only Allah gives us the izzah by believing Him and worshipping Him. Nationalism won't do that. Even the Prophet ﷺ, when he took over Mecca, I believe, he stamped his foot, he said, Nationalism is under my foot. Think about this. A few years ago, Ikhwan, relatively 10, 50, 60 years ago, 70 years ago, 
some guy, a colonialist, who killed your forefathers, drank their blood almost, and burnt their books, went on a map, and he drew some lines on a map, and you define yourself by those lines. Think about that. Yes, um, before the Big Bang, why can we not believe that matter has pre-existed pre eternally and that total energy in the universe is zero? You're probably reading Professor Krauss's book, A Universe from Nothing. Well, first and foremost, he doesn't believe it's actually zero. He says it's, it's, it's very close to zero. Secondly, if you read the works of cosmology at the moment, especially Professor Lawrence Krauss, it's very popularized science. But essentially, when he means nothing, he means the quantum vacuum, which is actually something. And according to most cosmologists, the quantum vacuum actually began. So that's not an issue at all from that perspective. How to argue with an atheist? Please also a little bit how you came to Islam. That's too much of a long story. It's the last question. So how to argue with an atheist? The question is wrong. You shouldn't really argue with an atheist. Uh, you should just basically discuss and have warm dialogue with them. You know, when you see debates online, don't see that's dawah. Debate is intellectual jihad. Yeah, we're removing the influentials that affect the ummah. But when it comes to normal people, they're human beings and treat them like that. Don't, don't give dawah to the judgment, give dawah to the reality. If I knew he was an atheist, la qadr Allah, but say he was an atheist for example, hypothetically, I don't want to now start judging him because he's an atheist, cold, scientific, rejecting the truth. Because the Prophet ﷺ was never like that. When he said to his Sahaba, he said, don't speak to me about anyone else. I want to connect with them how they should be connected with. So if I want to connect with this guy, atheist, I don't want to connect with my perception of what an atheist is. I want to connect with who he is. Because maybe he's atheist because his mom passed away when he was three years old of cancer and he can't explain it. But if I never connect with him properly, I just connect with my judgment of him, I will never understand that. So therefore we have to be, we have to follow the sunnah, don't fall for the trap. Just because people judge us, we don't have to use the same mechanisms, yeah? We have to follow the sunnah, give them the attention, rahmah, compassion, mercy, connection. And then, you know, use the arguments that we learn from Islam. For example, this universe began, there's no doubt about that. Did it come from nothing? I mean, you tell me how it could come from nothing. Did it create itself? Or was it created? What's the best answer? And, and start from that and then you can work your way forward inshallah. But f to be honest, I think atheism is nothing to do with intellectuality. It's to do with emotions. It's to do with psychology. And a lot of it is to do with your behavior inshallah ta'ala. So, you know, there's more other questions. Unfortunately, we can't address because of time. But may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you guys and, and, and grant you Jannah for those. And forgive you. We just had one question from the floor. Oh, from the floor. Okay, that's fine. Okay, one question. That's fine. This is a silly question. Actually, your background psychology. Well, I was doing some research on you this morning on YouTube. You talked about, mashallah, the big Boston party. Place. Yes. So, are you like a cosmologist? No, I'm not. No. No. <laughs> no, I'm neither. I just like reading. And plus, that Higgs Boston stuff I learned was from a professor. Um, although there's some other YouTube clips saying I don't know what I'm talking about, but they don't know what they're talking about <laughs> because I actually took it directly off a professor. Um, so we follow the Quranic narrative. If you don't know, ask those who know, uh, and that's very important. So you know, you know, one thing I find really difficult as well, especially in the West. You know, they promote free thinking and reading and intellectual activity, but the moment you have a stance about something, they say, "Who are you?" As if. You have to have things at the end of your name for you to, 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 to have a perspective. And, and that's the irony. And the irony is if we follow that then we'll have a new priesthood. Because we could only know things if we asked the professor. Do you see? So we have a new priesthood. The point is, follow the Quranic paradigm. The Prophet some said that wisdom is the possession of the believer. Where he finds it, he'll take it. And also, if you don't know, ask those who know. So if someone articulates something that is based on sure knowledge from an, a, a valid source, there's nothing wrong with talking about it. But the key thing in the Dawah is, when you speak about something, make sure you know what you're speaking about. Because sometimes we talk about evolution, but we have no clue. We think evolution is we came from monkeys. And that's actually not true, by the way. Evolution means we have a common ancestor with monkeys. Yeah? Not that we came from monkeys. Yeah? There's a big difference. Yeah? So the point is, when we know something, we have to, when we speak about something, we have to make sure that we know. And the, the point about the higgs boson thing was just to show that it doesn't deny God. It's just basically, they found 
the particle that makes up the Higgs field and the Higgs field is a thing that was switched on in the early universe that gave subatomic particles mass. That's it, it's very simple. You could even go on Google and Wikipedia and you get exactly the same answer. So the point was, because some Muslims were really scared because they used to call it the God particle but it's not, you know what it used to be called? The God damn particle, because they couldn't find it and they'll be like, God damn, we can't find the particle. <laughs> but, this, but see what the media does. It popularizes things in a wrong way and they call it the God particle, but it has nothing to do with God. It just, they, they found a particle that makes up the Higgs field. It's called the Higgs boson. And the Higgs field was switched on to give particles mass. And that doesn't deny God or even affirm it really. So yeah, the point of the video was to show it makes no difference. It's like saying, so what? Get over it. Pray. <laughs> you see, that was the point. Uh, but you're right, and I think the reason people like me have to do these videos and others like Abdurrahim Green and Adnan and others, the reason we do this, although we don't have an academic background in these things but we do ensure we get it from the academics, the reason we do it is because where are the Muslims? Wallahi, I feel like a fraud. I don't want to be here. You think I want to do da'wah? You think I want to be here? Okay, I do for the reward, but the point is there are thousands of ulama from Dar al-Ulum just around the corner in Dewsbury. Al-Azhar, Medina, Mecca, in all the institutions there are thousands of ulama in this country, million times more qualified than anyone probably seeing here including myself. But where are they? Where are they? Show me them. Show me! Where are they against the atheists, against the secularists, against the Tom Hollands of the world when he did the Channel 4 documentary saying that Muhammad Sassam didn't exist or there's no history for him? Where are they? It has to take miskeen people like us and we know we're miskeen, we don't hide that fact. We're miskeen, we're illiterate compared to the ulama. But someone has to stand up. Qum fa'andir. Who's standing? And this, this is why I'm thinking, what have these institutions done to these ulama? They gave them the knowledge, but where's the motivation? Where's the zeal and the izza for the deen? What do they end up doing? Writing books on wudu. Don't get me wrong, Ikhwan, wudu is an essential part of worship. But it's not, there's no gap in the knowledge. How many forms of wudu do we have? Fine, say four, say five, say six. But the books are available in every language. Why do you have to reinvent the wheel? There are so many more important things that the ummah is facing now. Aqidah, it's a clash of Aqidah now. Do you know 250,000 Muslims in Europe leave the deen of Islam every year? 6,000 in Bradford, 3,000 in Bradford every year. Who's standing up? Who's standing up? And we're all responsible. It's a collective thing, you know? You don't have to be a professor to give da'wah, you know? But we do our best and we do many mistakes, of course we do loads of mistakes. But as the ulama say, the one who's never done mistake in the da'wah before, has never done da'wah before. <laughs> yeah? So, you know, I'm, so, I'm sorry for using your question just to say something else, but I think it's important because I think the most important thing that we lack is not knowledge because we have all the ulama, we have everybody, it's just the motivation, it's that seed that we plant in someone's heart that gives them this, this zeal for the deen to defend the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, 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 to, and to proclaim it ud'u ila sabili rabbik call to the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and anyone could do it, the Prophet gave you ijazah many years ago, you don't need ijazah from any mufti the Prophet said convey for me even if it's one ayah now the condition is that you know the ayah and you know what you're talking about and that's it. So, so may Allah make it easy for us and you know may Allah motivate the people that deserve to be here because I don't deserve to be here, I'm a fraud from that perspective. And I believe all the du'at, where I, the organization that I'm from, IERA, believe that too. But they're thinking someone has to stand up and and we want everyone to. That's why we want to engage with communities and motivate them so we see people become better, much better and much more articulate and much more effective and much more in line with the Sunnah. And if we always have that mentality then Allah will make it easy for us I think. If it's not just about us and ego and gallivanting the world but it's about developing people and making sure they're better than us then maybe Allah will put barakah in it inshaAllah.